How's everybody doing today? I certainly hope you're doing well. It's time for another edition of Story Time. I like to let people know whether or not it's a true story or not. It is not a true story. It's a story in which I created. The name of the story is called Prison Meltout. Let's go ahead and begin, shall we? There was a 42-year-old man by the name of Kevin, and he worked for Exxon Oil Company out of South Dakota at one of their drilling sites. Actually, there's multi multiple drilling sites there. And he was the number one primary mechanic in charge of all the other little mechanics throughout all those different sites in that division of ExxonMobil. Now, Kevin had been working for that company for almost 30 years because, you see, when he was a very, very young man, his father also worked for that company as a mechanic. And we're not talking about any sort of mechanic just dealing with vehicles. Oh no, we're talking about this guy fixes the cranes and he fixes the tractors and the scrapers and the trucks and all of the equipment dealing with trying to extract the oil from the ground. He's one of the top mechanics of the company. He's making big money. But here's the thing. You see old Kevin, he lives in Idaho. So he's got to travel by truck, his own personal vehicle, to wherever that company sends him. And he's happy to do so because he's making between 45 and 65 bucks an hour. Plus all the perks. Plus the free lodging. Plus the per diems and free food and all this stuff. The man's making bang. But he deserved it because he's a fantastic mechanic. He sure is. That's right. That's right. But you see, even though Kevin has been living in Idaho for well over 10 years, he was on an assignment here in South Dakota for about six months. And it's time for him to break away. It's time to relinquish his responsibility to the second-in-command, if you will, to handle the operations dealing with fixing of all of the equipment necessary so that that way Kevin can go on a much-needed and deserved vacation. In other words, he needs to go back home. He needs to be able to eat on his own dishes and sleep in his own bed. Right? Have his own place instead of living out of a suitcase in a hotel somewhere. He's got to take up basically little duties of his own house. Right? In preparation for the winter. Because winter is going to be quite <laughs> downright ugly in Idaho. Sure can. So he's got to make preparations for all that. Here it is late autumn. So it gets dark around 5.30, 5 o'clock in that area. Right? 4.30ish. It just depends on where you're at. And here it is a Thursday and he's getting ready to scoot on out from South Dakota. He's got to drive from South Dakota to Idaho and that's what he's going to do. Yes sir, yes ma'am. So he loads up all of his things. He's pretty happy about it because he gets to go home. And it's not like he's on the other side of Idaho. No, he's just right over the border. As soon as he drives through, he's got to drive through all these states. He's just about 20 miles over that border. Always looking so forward to it. He sure is. But he's going to take his time. He's going to take his time. He's not going to rush. He's going to have three weeks off that he deserved. Paid to. Ha. Huh. Oh, good times, right? So he loads up his truck and he he starts going. He starts driving on down the road. And he's listening to the music and carrying on. You know how it is, right? He's looking so forward to sleeping in his own bed and eating off his own utensils, eating off his own plates, going to his own bathroom because all this thing is his, see, in preparation for the winter. And all winters, if you know that area, can get right ugly, right? downright ugly. So what he does is as he's driving down, he decides he's going to get a hotel and he's going to stay the night at a hotel so that that way he doesn't have to, you know, overextend himself when it comes to driving and such. Right? So he stays at a hotel. He forks down the money. It's not a big deal. He gets up about 8, 9 o'clock and he has a little bit of breakfast at the hotel there. Breakfast is included. Then he gets back in his vehicle, and off the road he goes. Well, hell, it's Friday now. It's Friday at about mm, 
not quite five o'clock it's about 4 30 it's creeping on dark it's getting sort of dark you know it's in the twilight zone area where it's kind of like not quite dark not quite light somewhere in between i tell you what he skips over the border he's only about 20 miles in and he's getting so close to his house because as he's going down the main road there's a little hill that goes up like this and he can kind of look over that hill and see his own house because his house is a brick house and it also has green trim with a tin roof so it's easy to spot and as he's going up that hill a little bit a rabbit kind of like dips out in the road he doesn't want to hit that rabbit so he kind of swerves a little bit but who's behind him all oh, police officer of course of course there has to be a police officer behind you when you when you dip the line right that's exactly what happens Police officer pulls him over. Whoop! Pulls him over, right? He can see his house. I mean, it's just right there. A couple of hundred feet. There it is, right? He's almost tall. But statistically speaking, it is an absolute fact that most tickets are given between DUIs and everything else five miles or closer to your house. That's a fact because people get comfortable and that sort of stuff, right? police officer gets out of his vehicle and he knocks on the window and Kevin rolls down the window about yay much. He's like, there a problem, officer? He goes, yeah, there's a problem. He goes, do you know why I pulled you over? And, you know, the rule number one is you never tell on yourself. So Kevin's like, I don't have a clue. He goes, well, I noticed you dipped the line there a little bit. You been drinking? He's being a little smarmy and add duty to uh, Kevin there, right? He goes, no, sir, I haven't been drinking, not at all. Matter of fact, I'm I'm coming in for my work on a really, you know, well-deserved vacation. And there was a rabbit that jumped out in the road, and I didn't want to hit him, so I did kind of swerve a little bit. Big deal. He goes, well, I need to see your registration, your insurance, and your driver's license. He's being all added to you again, unnecessarily. I mean, for what reason, right? So he says, okay, officer, I'm reaching for the glove box. Because I tell you what, when your hands start, you know, reaching around in your vehicle, you better let the officer know what's going on because you don't want to end up in a box. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So he opens up his glove box there. He's got his registration proof of insurance. He reaches into his wallet, gives him his driver's license. He goes, officer says to him like this, well, i tell you what, I'm going to run you for warrants. She goes, I ain't got no warrants, dude. I've been out of town for six months. Okay? I work for Exxon. I don't have any warrants. I'm their top mechanic. So he's kind of giving some a little back, a little attitude back. But with an underlying of respect, sort of. Right? Police officer, he walks back to his vehicle. Right? Opens the door, closes it. Starts getting up on that little computer, typing in and all that stuff. Then he starts shaking his head like this. And old Kevin's looking in the rear of your mirror. And he can see the lights are going. He can see that officer just barely kind of shaking his head. He's thinking, uh-oh, this isn't good. And it's not good. It's not looking good because it's not good. The police officer gets out of his car. He comes back over to Kevin's window. He goes, get out of the car. He could get out of the car. Is there, get out of your car now. And the officer reaches off to the right-hand side to his metal protector, if you get my meaning. He says, get out of the car. Okay. So you keep your hands where I can see him. Okay. He opens the door. He gets out of the car. He goes, turn around. Do you have any weapons on you? He, no. He starts searching, patting him down, carrying on. He goes, turn around. He goes, uh, you have a warrant out for your arrest. Kevin's like, a warrant? A warrant for what? He goes, failure to appear. You're supposed to go to jury duty, but you didn't show up. You got a summons, but you just thought it'd be better to go play around with oil in South Dakota. And guess what? You get an active warrant, and you are now under arrest. He goes, under a... He goes, but I didn't get any summons. I haven't been here to get a summons. There's no way I could have gotten a summons, and you can call my employer, right? Tell it to the judge. That's what the police officer says. 
He goes, but, but, oh. the officer says, do you mind if I check your, your vehicle? Do you mind if I search your truck? He goes, no, you can't search my truck. Go get a warrant. He goes, you know what? I'm going to search it anyway. I don't need a warrant. Son, do you know where you're at? He's like, yeah, I'm in Idaho, less than a mile from my house. I can see it right there. You see that little brick house with green trim and a tin roof? That's my house. He goes, tell it to the judge. Right? He handcuffs him. And he goes, you have the right to remain silent. Anything that you say or do can be used to held against you in the court of law. You have the right to attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. He's reading him his Miranda rights. Right? He opens up the door. He sits him down in the police car. He leaves the door open so he can have a little communication with him. Then he goes over to his truck. And he starts searching around, looking around, all that stuff. And he sees his badge hanging down. Right there on the rear view mirror. Sure enough, it says Kevin. He's got a little picture there. He works for Exxon Mobil as a mechanic, lead mechanic. He didn't care about that. He starts rifling through, looking up under the seats, over the ashtray, looking everywhere, looking for little secret compartments. And you hear Kevin there screaming something. He goes, "What do you, what do you run your mouth about?" Police officer walks over there. What are you running your mouth at? He goes, sir, can you please check again? Please check again. That's not me. Maybe it's some other Kevin. I swear it's not me. I've been out of town for six months. You can call my employer. I mean, hell, when you illegally searched my vehicle, you would have noticed my, my badge right there on the, on the rear view mirror. I'm not telling you a story. There's no way it could have been me. You got the wrong guy. Tell it to the judge. That's what he says. Boy, I tell you what, this is getting interesting, and it sure is. He says, officer, he's pleading with him. He's like, officer, listen, you know what? Don't tow my vehicle. Are you kidding me? Don't put my vehicle in impound. My house is right there. You see it right there? It's a brick house with green trim and a tin roof. He's pleading with him, right? He goes, you can follow me. It's not like I'm going to race off and run off. He goes, I don't need this. I'm here to go on vacation. I don't need to be incarcerated than have my my truck incarcerated with me. This is ridiculous. You got the wrong guy. Tell it to the judge. Police officer calls in dispatch. We need to get a little tow truck out here. <laughs> right? He's calling in for a tow truck. So the police officer, he waits there, and you got old Kevin, he's still raising the hell in the back seat, saying, you got the wrong guy. There's no way. I've been here for six months. I went from here. I came back to get ready for winter and all. Tell it to the judge. Wow. Tow truck company. Tow truck pulls up. Got the officer talking to the tow truck driver. Yeah, I'll see you at impound. Ha ha, it's a big old joke. Police officer gets in his vehicle after the tow truck is towing his vehicle away. He starts driving to the police station because Kevin is under arrest. That's right, because he's got an act of warrant because he didn't go to court. He didn't go to jury duty, even though he got a summons. But he couldn't have gotten a summons because he's been gone for six months in South Dakota working for ExxonMobil. Something is wrong. Somebody's making a mistake. Somebody's making a big mistake. But you know what? They don't care. They don't care. Because if they make a mistake, it's no big deal. But if you make a mistake, oh my goodness, you're in big trouble. Right? Yes, that's right. That's how it works. It sure does. So let's go ahead and continue, shall we? Hell, it's about six miles from where he pulled him over, where he pulled Kevin over. It's about six miles from there to the jail. Because that's where he's going. Kevin says, you know something? Listen, you can't put me in jail. He's all locked up in that. He's got the handcuffs behind his back. He's a little bit uncomfortable. Because old Kevin, he can't stand to be in, in little, you know, places in that. Claustrophobic he is. Oh, Kevin's used to working in the oil fields where he can move his hands all the way around, where he can take one of these big old cranes and move it, you know, a quarter block all the way around every direction. Breathing that real thin air, but that cool air. 
He's used to being free. He can't be all locked up anywhere. He'd never been arrested anyway. So he tells the officer, he goes, you know something? If I don't want to be in that jail, I'm not going to be in that jail. And I'm going to melt my way right out of there. <laughs> Please looks at him and goes, you going to do what? He goes, I'm telling you, I'm claustrophobic. I can't stand it. I mean, I will go out of my mind and I will, I will melt myself out. Peace officer is like, listen, are we going to have to do a BAT on you too, which is a blood alcohol test or blood analysis test? Or are we going to have to do some sort of toxic, toxicology report on you because you're acting batty and fruity and loopy and all that nonsense? And you're talking about melting your way out of jail? What? He starts laughing and carrying on. Kevin's trying to plead with him again. He goes, sir, check again. Listen, you got the wrong. I'm tell it to the judge. Huh. He gets in there for booking. He's got to stand up there with this little plate in front of him. He's got to... They take his picture. Turn to the side. Right? They're getting his fingerprints. His full name. His address. Date of birth. Social security number. All that stuff. His employment. La, la, la. Carrying on and about. They make him aware that he's got to pay a $30 fee, processing fee. What? He goes, I'm not paying you $30 for anything, ever, never. Well, if you don't pay the $30, we'll put you to collections. He goes, you can put me to a collection, I ain't paying nothing. Matter of fact, it is the municipalities get funding from the public, right, through taxes. Usually the property taxes or lotteries or who knows what. And you want to charge me $30 because you wanted to arrest the wrong guy? Is that what you're telling me? I'll never pay that, ever. He goes, and on the contrary, if I don't want to be in your little cell here, I'm going to melt my way out. That's, who, that's what he's telling the, the booking officer. And he's like, wait a minute, what? You're going to do what? You're going to, what? You're going to melt your way out? Really? And they start laughing, you know, the arresting officer and booking, they start giggling, laughing, carrying on. Right? And they said, well, you're going to be arraigned on Monday, which means you're going to have to stay here all weekend long unless, of course, you can get some sort of bail. He goes, no, I'm not bailing out anything because you arrested the wrong guy. And if I don't want to be in that cell, I'm going to melt my way out, so it's not going to matter anyway. And they're laughing. They just can't even believe it, right? So they put him up in his orange jumpsuit there, and he's got Idaho jail in the county and the little number on the back there. He's wearing these little booties and carrying on. They open up the cell. They toss him in there. They close it up there. He's by himself. He doesn't have another cellmate with him. But you see the officer that put him in the cell, he told him like this. He goes, Kevin... You know what? You just don't worry. You're going to have company, all right. About 11, 12 o'clock, you know, tonight, when the drunks are arrested and tossed in here for all the DUIs. Because after all, it is Friday night and all. So you ain't going to be alone for long. Huh. Kevin is infuriated. First of all, he can't stand being a little bitty cell like that. He's claustrophobic. He is. I mean, this is real. So what's he do? Well, he's got a plan. He's going to melt his way out of there. And you might say to yourself, Monty, how in the hell is he going to melt his way out? That's impossible. You want to talk about impossibilities? There's nothing, my friend, that is impossible. No, sir, no, ma'am. Let me give you an example of what you would think would be impossible, but it's not impossible, and it happens all the time. Matter of fact, it happens millions of times. Let's take a solid insect with a bunch of legs called a caterpillar. And you mean to tell me that that caterpillar is going to weave itself a cocoon, knowing damn good and well. It's going to go through some sort of physical metamorphosis to turn itself into a butterfly and fly away. Now do you think everything is impossible? Nothing is impossible. And that's the best example that I know that proves nothing is impossible. But how does this relate 
to Kevin and him being in jail. Because Kevin is going to go through what is called personal, psychological, kinetic, directed energy to his hands to melt himself out of that jail cell. He sure is. You see, kinetic energy is push-pull, push-pull. And he's going to, going to do exactly that. I'm sure you've heard of a scenario called instantaneous combustion. A lot of people scoff. They think that's nonsense. A lot of people think it's impossible. But here we go. Instantaneous combustion is actually where a person can raise their body temperature to great heights that they literally catch on fire. So you think that's impossible? Oh, it's not impossible. No, it's not. But you see, what's even more possible is the fact that Kevin is going to melt his way out of that cell because he can't stand being in there. He can't take his, his arms and move all the way around. He can't do it. But he's going to do it out in the hallway because there's a lot of room in the hallway. So he's going to melt himself out and he's going to sit down in the hallway. He's not trying to escape the facility. He just wants out of that little claustrophobic little room. That's what he does, ladies and gentlemen. He sure does. He puts his hands up there and he's, he's concentrating. He's trying to force all the heat. All this heat into his hands so he can melt the bars to get out of there. And that's what he does. As he's holding on like this, he's just a shaking and carrying on. It starts ripping out. You'd think there was a welder in there getting busy on the damn bars. Uh-uh. He grabs two more and he melts those down. Then he reaches down below and he melts these and melts those. And, you see what I mean? Takes that, <laughs> takes it out and he puts it down on his, where he's sleeping at, right? And he literally sticks his head through and his shoulder and he walks right out and he sits right down there in the hallway. <laughs> he's just sitting there. Because see, he's got somewhere to move his arms. He's not all captive in that little bitty cell. Well, about 20 minutes later, a guard comes out and notices that there's a prisoner sitting on the floor in the hallway and he's not in his cell. What is going on here? The prison guard comes up and says, What are you doing and why are you out of your cell? Kevin looks up at the police officer and he says, I have the right to remain silent. Anything that I say or do will be held against me in the court of law. I have the right to an attorney. If I can't afford an attorney, one will be provided. He's reading his own Miranda rights. He's not answering their questions. The police officer looks over and he says, Oh my gosh. He says a big section of the cell has been melted away. Somebody had a, <laughs> like a welder was in there, right? He can't even believe it. And there it is sitting on his cot. He gets on the radio. <laughs> Next thing you know, there's 15 officers running out, running down the hallway. They're like, oh my God. They can't even, they're all in disbelief. They can't believe it. They look at him and say, how in the heck did you do that? How did you get out of your cell? How did you do this? You're going to tell us how you did this. And he looks up to the officers and he says, I have the right to remain silent. Anything that I say can and will be used against me in a court of law. I have the right to an attorney if one cannot, you know, if I can't afford one, God forbid, one will be appointed to me. Isn't that great? And he's reading his Miranda rights. He's not answering the questions. Mm -mm. So they grab him by the scuff of his neck and his, basically his prison uniform. They drag him over to the interrogation room. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And now the person who's in charge, in other words, the captain that is in charge of the entire unit, the entire jail, the entire police department, he walks in that interrogation room. They got pictures of how we melted these bars. He's in disbelief. He goes, listen here, buddy. You're going to tell us how the hell you did this because I don't see any welding equipment there. So apparently you did this. And he looks up at the guy and he says, I have the right to remain silent. Anything that I say or do will be used against me in a court of law. Did you realize that I have the right to an attorney? And if I can't afford one, <laughs> he's not talking to him. 
He's giving his own Miranda rights to them. And they are furious. This guy, he says to him, you know what we're going to do? Hmm. I tell you what we're going to do. What time we got? He looks at his watch. It's about 10 o'clock at night on a Friday. He goes, I tell you what we're going to do. You're going to stay in this interrogation room all weekend if it, if it takes it. You're not going to have any water. We're not going to give you any bathroom break. We are not going to feed you. And we're not going to let you sleep until you tell us how you did this. And we don't care how long it takes. You're, you're to be arraigned on Monday morning at 9 a.m. So, let's see, it's 10 o'clock, um, Friday night. Yeah, you're going to be here a while. So, you just keep that in mind. Well, hours go by. Hours and hours, and a couple of more officers, two different officers, a male and a female come in, and they're trying to talk to them. They're like, listen here, buddy. Um, we just want to know, listen, if you just tell us, playing good cop, bad cop guy, right? If you just tell us how you did this, uh, we'll let you go. We'll let you get something to eat. You can go on a potty break and all this stuff. And he goes, you know, guys, I have the right to remain silent. Everything that I do and say can be used against me in a court of law. <laughs> and the darndest thing, I have the right to an attorney. If one, and they're like, yeah, 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 I'm to get up and leave. Hours and hours and hours go by. Oh, Kevin, he's getting kind of tired. So he starts kind of falling asleep in his chair, and they got them all locked up there, too, you know. They got the shackles, and they got a little pole down for his ankles, and they got them all shackled up there, a little bar there on the table. And he starts going to sleep, and they blast, full blast Led Zeppelin or something, right? <laughs> you start a link. Oh, he tries to sleep, and they blast it again, right? So here he is. He has nothing to eat. He has nothing to drink. It hadn't been going to the bathroom break. So right there, he sold himself, and he's happily to do it, too. Because he doesn't care. He knows that every time those officers walk in there, guess what they get to smell? His stomach. Right? Yeah, that's right. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Because he's going to break them. Well, about 5 o'clock in the morning, this is like 5 o'clock in the morning, early, early Saturday morning. They decide they're going to put him in isolation because he's not cooperating at all. And what's an isolation? Well, there's a little bitty slat with a little rubber thing on the front part of it so they can slip, you know, your meals up underneath the door. There's a little slat there so they can open up and look in, see how you're doing and that, but there's really no light in there. It's solitary confinement. Yeah, they put him in there. It's got a big old metal door. It's about this thick, too. Boy, it's something crazy. They toss him in there. So what's Kevin do? He starts, he starts counting. He starts counting as the as one of the officers is walking by there, right? There, he's counting one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, one thousand four, one thousand five, because he doesn't have a watch there. He doesn't have a timer. There's no sense of time there at all. He's in isolation, right? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So he figures that every 45 minutes, a guard is walking by. Well, guess what? He only needs between 20 and 30 minutes to bring all of this heat into his hands so that way he can melt his way out yet again. And that's what he starts to do. As soon as that guard walks by, he places his hands up on where the hinges would be, and he starts bringing all the heat that he can into his hands, and he just melts right through the door. He sure does, but it takes him six times to do it, right? Oh, yeah, he's at it for a while. And after he melts all the way through the bottom, he just pushes the door, and it makes a big old noise. And what's he do? Does he escape the facility? No. Kevin just walks out, and he walks over the door, and he sits down in the middle of the pod. just kind of like this. But before he sits down, he takes his arms and he goes all the way around. They get this on camera, too. Mm -hmm. He sure do. But what's that all about? Because Kevin doesn't like small places. He has, he's claustrophobic. He's got to be free. Kind of like he is out there in South Dakota. When he's working on all those big old cranes and bulldozers and scrapers and all that heavy equipment and such. Breathing that air, that fresh air. 
He doesn't have time to be sitting in some little cell about five by eight. Forget it. Yeah. Here we go again. The guards come out and they're out of their minds. They cannot believe this dude melted that door. What are you kidding me? Oh, it's crazy. But see, they didn't have any cameras on the inside because it's like pitch black in there. Right? They got cameras on the outside and the pods and that pointing to the, all the rooms. But again, they don't know how he's doing this. <laughs> it's something else. So all these officers race in. They go, okay, this is it. How in the heck did you do that? You're going to tell us how you did that. And he looks up at him and he goes, you know, I have the right to remain silent. Anything that I say or do will be, you know, used against me in a court of law. I have the right to an attorney. And if I can't afford one, fellas, one will be provided. Here we go again. He's reading his Miranda. Oh, these guys are furious. They're furious. Because I'll tell you what, the last thing that the police, the last thing that the judicial system, the last thing that a prosecuting attorney, the last thing that an investigator doesn't want is for you not to talk to them. They want you to talk to them. So they can twist your words in little bitty bowls and like mold them into, play these little psychological games with you. But when you don't talk to them, it infuriates them. And when you read off the Miranda right, or the Miranda rights, and recite it right back to them as an answer, they get infuriated. Oh, it pisses them off. It's right up there with calling a certain precinct because you're displeased with what one of their officers did. It's right up there on how much they hate it. Because they hate that too. They hate it when the public starts asking them the questions to explain themselves. Oh yeah. So what do they do now? Well, I tell you what they're going to do. They had an idea. The captain that is in charge of the entire facility there, he had a great idea. They're going to take a video camera and they're going to place it on the outside of a cell. They're going to put him in yet another cell and they're going to have it all videotaped if he decides he's going to do something skippy. So here they got it from his like stomach all the way up wide angle so they can see all the bars. Right? So whatever he does, they're going to capture it. Yeah? Right. So what happens next? Well, they decide they are going to give him some food. They're going to give him some to drink. He has like some milk and some food there, right? And of course, they wash him up. He takes a shower and all that. All that mess. So they're kind of treating him okay now, like a regular prisoner, I suppose. Because they want him to try to pull some spanky nonsense. So after he gets done with his meal, he takes his meal and he slides it back out under that little spot right at the bottom of the, of the cell there. Hmm. And he gets to thinking, well, they're all watching me. I got a video camera on. They're probably watching everything I do. So <sighs> Then he gets to think, wait a minute. That food tray that I just slid under, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'm going to melt out down below, and they're not going to see what happened. <laughs> so here we go again. He goes down below, and he gets up on his stomach there, and he's holding the freaking bars, and he's just bringing all the heat to his hand, he's just melting it, right? And then he takes two more bars over here and just... Bleh, bleh. And you see a little bit of smoke in front of the camera, but you don't see what he's doing because he's on the floor. <laughs> he takes that off, lays it up on his cot, and he wiggles out of there, and he goes sits down the hallway. Sitting there like that. <laughs> that guard comes out and he goes, Oh, here... <laughs> all these police officers, here we go again. Here they got the video cameras, worthless. All they see on the camera is a little bit of smoke coming up because he's mounting the bars down below. <laughs> he gets out there, right? He goes, guys, you're not gonna you're not gonna keep me incarcerated. I'm gonna melt my way out every time. I don't care what you say. Right? He goes, Well, at least you were saying something. You said something. He goes, but here's the thing there, uh, Kevin. When you came in here, you had a misdemeanor. You got that? And uh, now you have three felonies because you are guilty of destruction of federal property three times. And we know you did it. 
and you're going to tell us how you did it. Because if you don't tell us how you did it, we're going to find out. We're going to find out how you did it. One way or another. Kevin looks at him and says, I have the right to remain silent. Everything that I say or do can be used against me in a court of law. You know I have a right to an attorney, and if I can't afford one, one will be appointed. Darnest thing. These guys are out of their minds. So all the officers get together with the original arresting officer, the first officer that encountered Kevin. They wanted to know in detail his demeanor, why they had pulled him over, what, what, what was the chart, all this stuff. So they started talking to him, and the captain of the entire facility says, wait a minute, what, what, wait, wait a minute. You made a mistake. He's telling that to the arresting officer. He goes, no, I didn't. He goes, yes, you did. If you notice right here on the booking information, um, this is Kevin L. His middle initial is an L, not an I. You arrested the wrong person. The arresting officer started looking on the computer and he goes, oh, man. You're, you're right. Oh, shh. But does it matter? Does it matter, ladies and gentlemen? That's an honest question. Does it matter that the police officer, the arresting a police officer, does it matter that it was he that made the mistake? Consequently, there's no way that Kevin would have melted out if the arresting officer didn't have his head in his posterior. And if he would have listened to the pleas of Kevin, that in fact he did arrest the wrong person. But does this mean that Kevin is still going to have these three felony charges against him for the destruction of federal property? Ah, uh, yes, that's exactly what it means. Isn't that neat? That is wonderful, isn't it? Are you aware that um, the police can lie to you, buddy? They sure can. They can tell the biggest lie, the biggest story of all time to get you to confess, to get you to tell on yourself. But you can't lie to them. If you lie to them, that's a felony. Did you know that? Do you Are you aware that a police officer can fill out an affidavit and sign his name to it? All of it's BS. All of it's just riddled with lies. But if you do it, it's a felony. Did you know that? Yeah, that's true. Are you aware that police officers and people in the judicial system can make outrageous, erroneous mistakes? And it's, it's nothing. It's no big deal. But if you do it, it's a very big deal. Yeah, that's life. That's how things work. Huh. Yep. So here it is. It's creeping up at 9 o'clock Monday morning. Kevin is going to be arraigned in front of that judge. He sure is. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, all the officers know by now that the original arresting officer arrested the wrong person. The judge is going to find out real quick. But they didn't notify Kevin about this. Well, why not? Because that would be grounds of a lawsuit, now, wouldn't it? And if you really wanted to push the envelope, those bars never would have been destroyed by melting, of course, if Kevin wasn't incarcerated unjustly in the first place. Right? But does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Right? So what's he going to do? He's going to tell it to the judge. He sure is. So he gets there and he's standing in front of the judge. The judge says, um, now I'm looking over. He sees right up top the arresting officer arrested the wrong man for failure to appear for jury duty. Right out the gate, is something wrong. But he also sees that he's melted out of frickin' his cell three times just over the course of the weekend. And he reads out these charges of the three felonies. He drops the misdemeanor for failure to appear. But he says, well, now you're being charged with three felonies of destruction of federal property. How do you plea? 
And Kevin looks at him and says, You know, I have the right to remain silent. Everything that I say or do can be held against me in the court of law. Are you aware that I'm, you know, have the right to an attorney and I can't afford one? One will be... And they just said, just... He said, stop that. Just knock that off. Okay? One moment. And all of a sudden, a bailiff kind of like runs up over to the judge and whispers something in his ear. Right? When the bailiff walks away, the judge says, this case is dismissed. That's it. Well, guess what? Guess what that means? That means no charges. That means that all of this nonsense that he was charged with or was going to be charged with is not even on his record. It's been expunged like it never even happened. What? Gosh, that doesn't happen every day. How in the hell did this happen? Oh, well, it's the darndest thing. You see, one of the police officers decided on Saturday night to contact his employer to verify his employment with ExxonMobil and told them the story that he was under arrest and he was being incarcerated at the Idaho jail there for failure to appear in all that garbage. Right? Yeah. Well, you see, what was really kind of neat is ExxonMobil decided that they were going to pay about a quarter million dollars to get him out of jail. A quarter million. You got that? And to make sure that all of those charges disappeared. And that's exactly what happened. And do you know why that happened, ladies and gentlemen? Because the entire judicial system in this country is based on money. That's it. There is no justice. None. Zero. The only way that people, people are held accountable for what they did is if they can't afford it. Right? And there's one thing you just always should remember. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can be held against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney if you can't afford one, one will be appointed. It's playing on the same team. I'm Monograph, and if you can't speak freely, you're simply not free.